thing then. That's good. All right, so uh, ME 354, Mechanics of Materials. So this course generally focuses on how and why stuff deforms and how it breaks. So it kind of touches on every aspect of engineering uh, to some degree, because at one point or another, everything is going to break. Um, and so th the goal of this is to kind of give you a framework uh, from a materials perspective of, of why materials behave in the ways that they do. So there's a couple fun historical examples that I'd like to start off with. Uh, this, the field of mechanics of materials is kind of a, a reactionary one. So throughout history as, as different engineering and, and design progressed, uh, we inevitably ran into new ways that things could break. Um, so. Does anyone, can you all see that? All right, I don't know, is this, can you, maybe we should lower the, the blinds a little bit. Yeah, turn around on the back. It's not a super, not a super great projector. There we go, better? Cool, 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 cool. So, um, does anyone recognize this picture? It's a pretty famous historical one. Maybe? Yeah? How about, ha has anyone heard of the Liberty ships in World War II? Okay, who knows what happened with the Liberty ships? Feel free to just go for it. Because of how cold the Atlantic was, they cracked? Yeah, or yeah. Uh, so this one uh, was actually in a uh, harbor in Portland. Um, but so this was uh, sometime in World War II, they wanted to ramp up their production. They started building these cheap cargo ships um, using what ended up being very faulty welds. Um, and because the temperature of the water got cold at night, turns out steel has what's known as a ductile to brittle transition. So steel um, at room temperatures is pretty ductile. You can deform it and it deforms plastically a lot. And when it gets really cold, it does not and it breaks. And so all these faulty welds ended up failing on these Liberty ships. And I think they had constructed something like 4,000, no, uh, something on the order of 4,000 of them. And like two, by the end of the war, 2,000 had some mode of failure in them. Uh, and some of them catastrophically failed and, and were not able to, to be salvaged at all. Um, so this was a big example of, of one, the kind of the, the start of fracture mechanics, when, when fracture started getting interesting as an engineering problem. Um, and two, the, the concept of, of temperature affecting material properties, specifically fracture toughness. Um, there's another fun example, uh, when people started flying in airplanes. Uh, you probably don't recognize this image. This is uh, on display in the Science Museum in London. Um, but has anyone heard of the de Havilland Comet? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so uh, when we first started commercial airline flights, um, basically there, there was a whole lot of, un well, initially there was a whole lot of unknowns of whether we could get up into the air or not. Um, and when we figured out we could fly, eventually there was, there was an effort kind of after World War II to start mass producing commercial airliners. Um, and a lot of the planes during World War II uh, and during World War I to some degree, uh, they just kind of slapped together and threw up in the sky and they didn't need them to survive for more than a couple flights anyway because they were going to get blown up. Um, when they started doing commercial airliners, all of a sudden they needed to repeatedly go up and down out of the air hundreds if not thousands of times. Uh, and so there was a few major catastrophic failures that happened uh, with commercial airliners. So this was the de Havilland Comet, which was the first commercial airliner. Um, and on one of their flights from Rome to London, uh, the I think they kind of they they were rising up to climbing altitude, thirty four hundred feet or thirty four thousand feet. By the time they got up to twenty nine thousand, uh, people on the ground saw the ship kind of fall apart and everything went down. Um, so they went and pulled some of the pieces out of the Atlantic Ocean, or out of the Mediterranean, or wherever, uh, and ended up crashing and they tried to figure out why the heck this plane went down. And it turned out, um, if you look here, what's, what's wrong with the windows there? What's different about windows than a normal commercial airliners now? They're square. So They're square. Yeah. 
So, stress concentrations. So this was when we started learning about stress concentrations as engineers. And we saw, oh, well our, our square, square windows have all these cracks coming out of the corners. And so that's a problem. Um, there's another fun example when we started building railroads. So um, this is uh, a railroad in New Zealand. I think this was actually 2000, 2009, some, sometime in there. Um, a pretty recent example, but uh, it turns out when you have a very long metal track that's being uh, rolled on by a train, it creates a lot of friction, creates a lot of heat, and it's being shined on by the sun, that also creates a lot of heat. Um, what do you think might have happened here? The metal expanded and then and it buckled, yep. So this is kind of a classic example of a, of a buckle failure of, uh, of a commercial, or of a, of a railroad track. Um, and so there's a fun video that I'm gonna pull up. Let's see. Uh, so I'll give you these all in lecture notes later. There's a fun YouTube video of this actually happening in real time, and it's wild to see because these kind of failures are very unexpected and rapid. So this is real time. So this is, you can see a train rolling up toward the track behind it there. Um, and kind of part of the way through, there's just this sudden buckling instability and the whole thing goes whoop. Um, yeah. So these types of failures are all well, the ones that I showed are, are particularly catastrophic, which is why they're fun to look at, because, oh, stuff went bang. Um, but in the course of this course, through, through this course, um, we'll kind of go through some of the fundamentals of, of the mechanics of why this sort of thing happens. Uh, particularly, we'll try to take a look at the materials uh, and try to understand from a materials perspective why, uh, why certain materials behave certain ways, why they fail certain ways. Um, how you can change the materials to, to try to compensate some of that. Um, and uh, yeah, so hopefully it'll be an interesting class. Uh, so let's stop that YouTube video. I'm going to have you, so in the, in the announcements yesterday, I forgot to put in the initial announcement, but um, I sent a reply after that asking you to bring an internet connected device, so I hope like a cell phone is fine, or a smartphone. Um, I'd like to do, so through the, through the course, I'd like to do some poll everywhere quizzes, kind of one, to keep you on your toes and make sure you're awake, and two, to kind of uh, hopefully engage you a little bit more, hopefully get you all uh, thinking and talking a little bit more actively during, during the course. So uh, my poll everywhere, poll EV uh, slash L-M-E-Z-A. And then we'll try out a couple poll everywhere. Um, when you have, when you're on, just kind of look up from your phone and, uh, or like, give me like a, a thumbs up or something. When it looks like most of you are on, then we'll jump to the first poll. First poll, let's just see if this stuff works. <laughs> I think there are 75 people enrolled in the class last time I checked. Um, so hopefully we'll get somewhere around 75 responses. It should be, oh, why is it locked? <coughs> poll is locked. Can you all respond? This poll is not working. Clearly this is a good test because this is a failure. <laughs> Uh, how do I unlock the holes? Let's let's switch to. Uh, why is it locked? No. Oh. Well, that's interesting. Still, still locked. No. All right. Let's let's try let's try the next poll. 
So my, my test to see if, it, if the poll works failed. Let's, let's try another poll. So um, there's, there's a whole bunch of different topics this co course covers. Um, I don't know how, uh, how much you've looked through a syllabus at all that I posted or uh, any, of the, any of the book or course materials at all. Um, but cool. So this is working. I'm all interested in learning how PolyV works. That's a that's an important one. Cool. We'll 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 talk about grades and general course organization after this. Um, failure, stress mechanics, break, how stuff breaks, stress strain. Nano is that? Do I see nanomaterial somewhere in there? Oh. There is nano material somewhere in there. Cool. Ooh. <laughs> All right. So uh, while you continue to populate this and make it run around <laughs> in circles, uh, so a little bit about my background, real quick. So I am a prof uh, a professor here in mechanical engineering. Uh, my research background is actually working on nano architected materials. So. Uh, what that means is, uh, so in, in the course we'll kind of go through everything is made up of atoms and those atoms form structures and those structures form more structures at different length scales. Uh, my research is actually on trying to engineer those nano, those architectures from the nanoscale up. So I, I design new materials kind of from fundamental length scales and try to, try to expand the material property space in doing so, trying to, trying to make materials that haven't really existed before. So my work encompasses a little bit of mechanics of materials, nanomaterials, nanomechanical testing, uh, and I'm happy to talk to you all more about that in depth if you're interested um, sometime in office hours or, or after class or whatever. Um, cool. So I'm glad that nanomaterials is on there. That's neat. Um, so uh, there's two prerequisites for this class that uh, Depending on how you all feel about them, I will be leaning. I will be going through them in more or less detail. So the first prereq uh, is MSC 170. So on a scale of one to five, how? So this is uh, or or equivalent if you're if you're a transfer student. Um, how comfortable do you feel with like intro materials, metal, ceramics, crystal structure, phase diagrams, uh, that? sort of thing. Cool. Yeah. All right. So maybe I'll spend a little bit more time in the beginning on materials. Yeah. Uh, one, one is bad. One is I don't know anything at all about materials. I've never seen a material in my life. I <laughs> Which, let's hope that that's not. <laughs> necessarily the case. Okay, cool. Uh, and the last one, so the other prerequisite for this class is CE220, which is intro to mechanics. Uh, so stress, strain, uh, some constitutive laws, Moore's circle, um, all of that. Uh, and so for, for CE220, a scale of one to five, one being I have never seen mechanics in my life, and five being I could do this with my hands tied behind my back, which would be very impressive. Um, okay, that's a little bit better. Cool, that's good. the The focus of this class will be on mechanics, um, so I'm glad that you, more of you feel a little bit more comfortable with mechanics. Um, so. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll go through that in a sec. Um, okay, so to, to take a quick uh, poll of the room, I think this is a, this class, last time I checked, was a good split between junior, sophomore, or junior, senior. Uh, so how many people are, are rising or going into their third year, junior year, junior standing? Okay, how many are going into their fourth year, senior year? or super senior year. <laughs> it's totally fine. It's, it's a normal thing to do. Okay. 
Um, and I think all of you are mechanical engineering. Uh, is there anybody who's not mechanical engineering? Okay, cool. So, uh, starting next lecture, I'll, I'll actually have uh, a sheet with all of your, your names and faces on it. Um, I would like to try to get to know you all at some point uh, during the year. So, uh, starting next class, I'll probably be asking maybe two, three, four people to kind of volunteer to uh, say your name so I can connect and into a face. These, these pictures, I think, were taken maybe like two or three years ago, so you may look slightly different than your picture. Uh, you may have a nickname that you go by, uh, but really, I, I'm interested in seeing what you're interested in taking away from this class personally, um, how it kind of uh, relates to your end career goals, if you want to uh, go into go to be an engineer at NASA, or if you want to go into finance, um, there's there's applicability for both of those. Um, but uh, it kind of I'd like to see over time what what the general what people are interested in, um, and I can ideally tailor the class slightly depending on that. But um, I don't know how much I can promise that. Uh, I also will give the the precursor that I am terrible at remembering names. Uh, I'm really good at remembering faces, and I will immediately forget names. So I'm going to be doing my best to remember all of your names, but I make zero promises. Um, okay, cool. So uh, let's talk about logistics for the class. Fun stuff. I know that's everyone's favorite part. Um, so mechanical behavior of materials. Uh, I posted the syllabus online last night. I don't know how many of you have gotten a chance to take a look at it. Um, so the class meets four days a week in this room, 9.30, uh, which might be slightly early for some of you, but hopefully you're all able to wake up and come on time. Uh, this class is kind of split into two distinct components. There's an a in-class part that will involve homework, midterm, final. Uh, and there's a lab part that'll be entirely run by the TAs. I think uh, one of the TAs, Sirwin, is here in the back of the room. Uh, I don't know if, uh, I think Praveen is still out of town until Monday, and then I don't know if Santosh is here. Okay, uh, but so that you'll be interacting with the TAs probably a lot more than you'll be interacting with me. Um, the lab, so breakdown, the lab will be about 60% of your grade overall. Um, so there's five labs in total, two, or let's, uh, let's go through that in a sec. Um, so the, the, the labs will be a much bigger part of your grade than, than the, the homework or midterm or final, um, overall 60%. Uh, and so the, the lab sections, uh, I think initially when you had all enrolled, there was just four sections, Monday, t uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, generally, th so there's one lab room down uh, MEB 127. Uh, that room is not super big and there's not, when we're doing the experiments, there's not a ton of equipment to go around. So what we had done in the past was actually just split those, uh, that 20 people into two groups of 10. Uh, what we did this quarter is actually made it official in the course register and we split you into two groups of 10. Um, so now there's eight sections instead of four. Uh, if you want to switch sections, so 10 is kind of, uh, it, I mean, really it's more people than should be in the lab at once, but it, it's like an upper bound for where we want to be in terms of people in the lab. If you want to switch around sections, uh, days or times, uh, and they're full, just find somebody else in that section and see if they're willing to switch with you. I am totally fine with it. Uh, the day your lab is will correspond to what day your lab is due. Um, so that's the only really big thing. Um, but otherwise, if, if you have a schedule conflict or, or something and you, you really need to switch labs around, um, find one of your classmates and, and talk to them and we can try to, try to accommodate things. Uh, but I'd prefer not to go over 10 people enrollment in each of those. There'll be no labs this week, um, and then next week we'll have a demo. So uh, course description, textbook. So there's uh, one recommended textbook for the course, not required, um, but it's a useful one. So this is Mechanical Behavior of Materials by Mark Myers and uh, Krishna Chawla. 
this uh, is a new textbook this year. Previously, we had used uh, Norman Dowling Mechanics of Materials book uh, that I wasn't a huge fan of. This one uh, goes through some of the, it, it, it more closely follows the topics as, as I like to talk about them, and it focuses particularly on materials. So there's a, there's a big emphasis on materials, different structures, different composites, different com uh, architectures of materials. Um, and so if you want to dig more into that, this is a really good book for it. And, it, and I think it does a good job of connecting uh, mechanics of materials with, with a big emphasis on the materials part. Like the, the materials is even in a bigger text there, uh, which is probably how they emphasize it. But yeah, so I, I am a fan of this textbook. Uh, it would be helpful if you want to do extra reading, but it's not necessarily required for doing well in the class. Um, there's a few additional texts, a few, uh, there's a lot of additional texts. I'll, uh, oh, there should be one book on reserve in the library, in the engineering library. I think this is my copy and I think I'll also put it on reserve in the library. Uh, and I actually have a couple copies for the TAs too, so I'll have some to play around with. Um, these books, as we go through different topics, uh, so each of these areas, there's a lot of depth that we will be scratching the surface of. So if, if we happen to come across, if by the time we get to buckling, we go through our, our three or four lectures of buckling and you're like, that was the coolest thing ever and I wanna learn a lot about buckling. There's an extra uh, reference book on buckling that you can really dig into. Uh, and I'm also happy to, to recommend more books on any one of these subjects. Uh, for the ones that we have uh, in the engineering library, I'll be putting those on reserve, or those should be on reserve. Um, some of them aren't in the engineering library. Uh, I don't know. I think the, on the only one was this, uh, actually this buckling book that the engineering library and the, uh, or the collection of libraries that we have access to didn't have. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're interested, let me know and we can try to figure something out. Uh, this class also focuses heavily on writing. So, um, this lab or this course doubles as a writing two requirement. Which uh, do any of you know what? Have you have you heard of writing two? Do you know uh, something about that? Okay. So uh, for engineering, uh, for ABET to be accredited as an engineering school and to give you a degree that actually gives you like a you're you're a, you're an engineer that graduated from a from a real engineering school. Uh, ABET, an organization, kind of comes and, and monitors uh, or checks through our, our courses, makes sure throughout the next two years or one year or throughout all, all four years of your education, you're, you're becoming a well-rounded, knowledgeable engineer. And part of that is you have to have two courses that are writing required, that are, that are heavy writing intensive courses. Uh, this one counts as one of those. So uh, if you don't like writing, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> This, this will be a, a writing intensive course. There's only two labs, so um, total there, there'll be five labs that you, that'll count for this 60%. Two of those will be formal reports and three of them will be write-ups. The write-ups will mainly be uh, go through the analysis and talk about the results. Um, so it won't be like a full formal, a, f a full written report. Uh, and then those two formal reports will be Full abstract intro, uh, procedure, discussion, conclusion, the whole the whole nine yards. And we will be grading uh, a lot on writing content. And so after this, I'll go through how we'll actually be breaking that down. Um, there's also lab demos. So next week uh, will be a photoelasticity demo. Those will actually count for extra credit. Um, so each of the labs will be, I think, a half a percent. There's four demos, and so each will be a half a percent extra credit. Um, there uh, I think generally interesting experimental techniques to learn. So photoelasticity, uh, we'll talk about I think more on Monday and then you'll actually um, get that lab next week, uh, is a technique that is really interesting and cool to see, but maybe not as relevant in day-to-day in -day engineering operations anymore. Um, it was really heavily used kind of a few decades ago, but it's fallen out of favor for DIC. Um, yeah, so, so there'll be four of those. Uh, along with the formal lab reports, I guess I'll, I'll talk about this 
when we go through the grading sheet, but there's also an opportunity for extra credit there. Uh, and then in class participation, so all those all those polls that you were clicking on, uh, I'll give, I don't know, some n number of polls. Uh, and then at the end of the year, I'll just go through and see how many of those polls you answered. And that'll pretty much count for that 1%. It's just kind of an, an extra incentive to make sure you're here and participating and clicking a button on your phone. The answers don't have to be right. Some of them are opinions and random word choices anyway. So um, yeah, homework, 10% of the grade. Um, it'll be short, kind of three problems generally graded on a, on a zero, you didn't do the problem, one, you answered it incorrectly, or two, you got the right answer scale. So uh, it's pretty low stakes. Generally, what I'll try to do is get conceptual uh, ideas across, and that'll be um, so on, on eventually the, the midterm and final, they'll be split uh, roughly 50-50 between conceptual questions <coughs> and then some uh, numerical problems. The numerical ones will go through some examples in class and that'll be what the, the numerical half of the midterm and final will be on. Um, and then the conceptual ones will be uh, close to what you're, what you're seeing in your homeworks. Uh, do, do, do. So, ooh, so this is another point that we can talk about. So I am planning on having a midterm that Friday of fifth week and then the Friday of 10th week, which is te technically doesn't count as a final. So uh, they, the courses won't be, or the, the midterm and final won't be cumulative. So I'll just be testing on what was taught in those five weeks respectively. We don't have to do this during 10th week. I think uh, I t technically it's a dead week and you're not supposed to have exams while you're getting ready for finals. but um, it, it'll be an hour long. We can have that during finals week if you'd like, or we can have it during 10th week. Uh, is there anybody who strongly opposes having it during 10th week? <laughs> yeah, you say that now. And then 10th week when everything is due and all of your projects are coming to a head and you have no time, and you're going to be like, oh God, why did I do this? Okay, I'll let it sit for another lecture and on Friday if there's anybody or at the end of the lecture if there's anybody who has objections come talk to me um, but okay for now we'll we'll plan on having that second midterm uh, Friday of, of 10th week um, what else lab work so those those two lab types of lab reports formal reports and lab write-ups uh, the write-ups are due one week after your lab period so if your lab is on Monday at 2:30. Your lab report is due the following. Your lab write-up is due the following Monday at two thirty. Um, for the formal reports, you have two weeks, um, so it'll be that two weeks after Monday at two thirty. Um, we want, or the the TAs will be grading those pretty much entirely. Uh, sorry, TAs. It's um, their hope. I, ideally, uh, they won't be kind of giant volumes of text uh, for the lab write-ups we're hoping like 10-ish pages and the formal reports 15, 20, um, excluding the appendices because if you have a whole bunch of code or a whole bunch of data that can take up a lot of space. Um, what else? Uh, late, uh, late assignments, late homework, late labs. Uh, so there is a, for the labs, there's a 1% per hour late policy. So basically if it's four days late, it's zero credit. Uh, and each day is roughly 25%, 24% off. Um, the homework is 2% uh, per hour. So uh, two days late and then you get a zero credit in the, so they'll be, they'll be turned in into the boxes in 236, which is next to us, I think the room that way. Um, and there'll be there'll be boxes marked with 354 and your your corresponding section that you can turn things into. Um, also in that room on the table, there's a timestamp thing, uh, an electronic timestamp. So you can take your your paper or your your homework or your lab, take it in. If you're turning it in late, uh, and it'll mark a time on there. Uh, if you're not turning it in late, you don't have to worry about it because we'll probably collect it at the at the times that they're due. Uh, and uh, if it is late and we and you don't have a stamp, if it's uh, timestamps, if it's late and you don't have a stamp, we'll mark it ourselves at the time that we pick it up. So um, we are not going to be collecting it like every hour on the hour. Uh, so if you turn it in and you forget to stamp it and we happen to collect it that evening, then it's going to get a stamp for that evening. So try to remember to, to stamp your work. You can also, in lieu of that, if you 
Okay, so in lieu of that, if you have it done and you turned it in, uh, you can take a, take a picture or scan it and send us an email. That also works as a timestamp. Or on the off chance that you're unable to make it to campus, um, you can take a picture and, and send it to us, and that'll, that'll count as, like a, as a timestamp. Any of those kind of work fine. Um, yeah. Yes. So, collaboration policy. That's the next one. Or, uh, yeah, somewhere down there. Um, so, on the homeworks and the labs, you're welcome to collaborate. Uh, you're welcome to talk to any of the people in your lab, people outside of your lab, on how to do the solutions. But all of the work must be yours. So, any writing must be yours, any code must be yours, um, and then if you do collaborate with people, just mark the names of the people, person or people that you've collaborated with. Um, I would expect like maybe one or two people or, or small groups of like two to four ish. Uh, you don't have to collaborate with anyone if you don't want to. Uh, this is strictly for your benefit. So it's, it's if you want, basically if you want to talk to people about the solution, if you're stuck on something, if you don't know how to write some part of the code, or if you don't know how to analyze something, if you if you're, I don't know, stuck anywhere, that's your opportunity to talk to people. If you're stuck on a discussion point, you can talk ideas and concepts through with people. All of that's fine, but all of the writing must be yours and all of the work must be yours. Um, and anything that we see, you'll be putting the names of people you're collaborating with on your sheet, so it'll be pretty easy to tell if you're copying from anyone. Any copying will result in a, in a zero credit for the assignment, and uh, repeat offenses will deal with as they come up. Hopefully that won't happen, but um, yeah, extra credit, again, half a percent per demo. Uh, I'll talk about the formal report, extra credit, and then in-class participation, uh, no plagiarizing. There's some stuff that I want you guys to learn by the end of it. So um, generally understanding mechanics of materials, so how stuff deforms, how stuff fails, how the materials play into that. Uh, you'll be learning in the labs a lot of experimental techniques, so hopefully uh, by the end of the course you'll have an idea of if I want to get a shear modulus, how do I test for shear modulus, um, for example? How do I, how, what kind of an experiment could I set up to do that? And, and you'll have sort of a, a suite of, of s techniques that you've, you've learned and you've learned, how to, you've learned how to do and learned how to analyze the results for that you'll be able to use later on. Um, most day-to-day -day, uh, like engineering stuff, you're not actually going to be doing tensile tests or torsion tests, or uh, you might be doing DIC. That's a pretty popular one nowadays. Um, but uh, and you'll be material properties from data sheets. But it's still important to know when you see a property in a data sheet what that property means uh, and how what it means to actually get a precise number. Like, what does it mean that? Aluminum has a, a Young's modulus of 70 GPA. How did they get that? How, how correct is that? How, what margin of error is there? This is the, the sort of kind of critical thinking that I, that I hope you're able to develop by the end of the course. Um, timeline first, I guess. Any questions so far from all that? Do the labs start on Wednesday or on Monday? Uh, Monday. So it'll start Monday next week, but it'll be a demo next week. So no stakes, low stakes, extra credit stakes. Well, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other questions on things? Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll be posting, along with posting lecture notes, or along with posting videos, I'll be posting lecture notes. So, um, <laughs> for example, today we talked about historical examples of stuff. I have this described in a bit more detail with some references and, and kind of examples of things. I'll be posting these online kind of along with, uh, as we progress through the course. I don't know if I'll be posting it ahead of time or not. I think I might just post, like, as we go through material, I'll, I'll post that section of the notes. Um, but still playing around with it. My handwriting is also terrible. I apologize in advance. Um, so that might be a reason to post them ahead of time so you have something legible to, to go off of. Um, yeah, but 
Um, I, I will be kind of in these notes and I'll, I'll try and lecture, but I might forget. Um, I'll be referencing sections of the text and other textbooks that are relevant or resources that are relevant. Yep. Other questions on stuff? Cool. All right. Uh, schedule. So there's a whole bunch of topics we'll go through. Um, we'll start off. So CE 220, you should have done a lot of beam bending, beam theory. Um, so hopefully that's somewhat fresh in your minds. Uh, the first write-up will be on beam bending, and that'll be, so on, on Friday and Monday, I'll go through basics of materials, basics of mechanics, just kind of a, a refresher of uh, some of those concepts that you should know generally for the course, uh, and then we'll go into beam bending theory uh, that after we get through that material and the first lab, uh, the first real lab that week two will be on beam bending. Uh, we'll go into stress strain and constitutive laws, so what is stress, what is strain, how do we think about them in three dimensions? Uh, I think you should have seen them in, in at least two dimensions before. Um, hopefully, uh, I, I, I'll try not to dig too much into detail on that because there's a whole class on, on just elasticity uh, that's actually being taught this quarter um, that you can dig into. But uh, if, you're, if you end up being interested in stress strain and constitutive laws, uh, we'll go through so uh, isotropic elasticity, anisotropic elasticity, viscoelasticity, those are all constitutive laws, plasticity and plasticity theory and yield surfaces. Um, I think you should have seen kind of up to elasticity and strain, uh, uh, stress transformations in CE220. I don't think you saw viscoelasticity at all, right? And I don't think you saw plasticity at all, right? Okay, cool. So I think new new topics will probably start kicking in like week midweek two, week three, uh, and if there's stuff, uh, if I'm kind of burning through some of the material in on up up until that point that is is review, we can kind of slow down and, and take a step back and, and go through it in a bit more detail, uh, depending on how you all feel about stuff. We'll play it a little bit by ear. Um, so. Once we get through all of the constitutive law stuff, then we start getting into uh, buckling, which is, uh, so plasticity, we get into buckling, uh, which is what you saw with the railroad stuff, stress concentrations. So if I have a hole in a plate, what, uh, how does that affect the stress, con stress distribution around that hole? Uh, that directly leads into fracture, and we'll spend a couple weeks on, on fracture. Uh, impact, which also relates to fracture, libel statistics, which also, which also re relates to fracture, and at the very end we'll talk about fatigue. Uh, that last week, depending on how fast we've moved through stuff, uh, we can go into some specialty topics, nanomechanics, nano indentation, uh, shape memory alloys, like weird materials, uh, Bauschinger effects, like if, if I'm going through cycling, if I'm, if I'm cycling to high stresses, there's, there's some interesting uh, stuff that happens to, to stress strain responses. Um, this one will kind of be play by ear. If we get to this point and it looks like we're going to have extra an extra lecture or two to go through topics, I'll kind of leave it up to you all um, by popular vote, whichever topics you want to go through, uh, and we can we can hit that at that time. Um, labs as we're going through them. So photo is your first one. Beam buckling. Uh, our beam bending is the is the first real lab. You'll have a viscoelasticity demo, uh, and then uh, a tension formal report. So your first write up will be second week, and your first formal report will be fourth week. And so that um, I guess that fourth week lab will get turned in week six, and we'll we'll try to have a fast grading turnaround. But with seventy five people in the class, it takes a while, um, and it's all in TAs. So. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there's three TAs, so hopefully it'll move along. But it's 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 tough with with that much writing and that many people. Um, the after that, uh, I haven't we haven't decided if I want to do an IOS high school creep test. It'll probably be a creep demo there, but it's it's a demo, so it's not super high stakes anyway. Uh, and then after that, after we get past the midterm, we'll kind of go into overdrive. So. We'll have a write-up on torsion, a write-up on buckling, and then a formal report on stress concentrations, all kind of back-to-back. -back. 
So it'll be a little bit easier in the beginning and then kind of a, a ramp up at the end. Um, that it seemed to be the best way to work out the schedule. Hopefully uh, it all goes well. well. We'll see. And then after that formal, formal report, this one will be due 10th week. Uh, and so there's no lab ninth week and there's just an extra demo 10th week on a, on a fun Charpy impact experiment. Um, cool. Any questions or concerns on the schedule? Uh, right. So the only one that'll conflict is that one Veterans Day holiday, and we'll, it'll just be that one day that's canceled, and we'll have to do something to move people into sections. Um, we might make a Friday section, or we might see if, if everyone can get dispersed into those other six time spots. Uh, we're going to have to play that one by year, and depending on, on what schedule conflicts there are, we'll, yeah, we'll see. Thanksgiving, there is no lab uh, that week, which solves that problem. And I don't think there's any other holidays anywhere else. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll figure this out closer to when it comes up. Thanks. Other questions, thoughts, concerns? How much online modeling are we doing? Are we doing FEA analysis? Or? Uh, Nope, no FEA. I'll, I'll probably show some FEA. Uh, I think in the in the photoelasticity lab there is like a here's the FEA of the curved beam that we'll show you, and then you'll see the photoelasticity in the in the actual experiment. Uh, in the course, I might show like FEA on a on a stress concentration around a hole because that's a convenient one to do. Um, but we won't be doing it at all in the course. This is mainly an experimental lab course. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there will be DIC at the end. So this stress concentration lab will have DIC, so the digital image correlation, which is a computer analysis technique, not quite FEA, but um, yeah, still, still experimental, but computer analysis. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm planning to start them next week. If there are a whole bunch of people who really want to talk to me today after lecture, uh, I can hang around. My office is around the corner, 224. Um, but yeah, it'll probably start next week, Monday. Yeah. Other stuff. Uh, one note analysis for the labs. So there'll be a day that we talk about um, data analysis techniques. Uh, so. This one, week three. Uh, week two, we'll talk about error analysis, and week three, we'll talk about data analysis. There's no software that you need to use to analyze the data for the labs. That you'll, so for the experiments, you'll be you'll be getting something between a small amount of data to thousands and thousands of data points. Um, for the small amount of data, you're welcome to use Excel or or something equivalent uh, to analyze things. For large data sets, I recommend using MATLAB or Python, and that on week three, we'll, we'll be talking a little bit about strategies for how to analyze data using, uh, I'll probably talk about it in Python. Um, so how many of you, quick Paul, how many of you know MATLAB or are somewhat comfortable with it? Okay, most of you. How many of you know Python and are comfortable using it? Cool, cool, cool. So maybe I'll do the demo in MATLAB. <laughs> I'm, uh, at some point, I, I strongly encourage all of you to learn Python. It's a much more useful and general <laughs> programming language. I used MATLAB for like eight years before trying to learn Python, and I would not switch back to MATLAB after using it for like the last three-ish years. Um, yeah, so that's my, my two cents on it. I know it's also a big time sink if you want to learn it. Um, cool, so we have almost no time left. Uh, real quick, uh, there's I, sheets posted online for how the labs will be graded. If you want, we can go through this in a little bit more detail closer when they're actually due. We've tried to coarse grain some of the grading, so you can see kind of point by point how things are, how you're being graded, how you're being, how points are being assigned. Um, uh, for the formal write-up, you can see that a large portion of the grade, 30 out of 100 points, is quality of writing. So we really are trying to focus on you writing well. 
uh, and we'll talk a bit in the course about strategies for writing well. Uh, and then there is, an, for the formal reports, an extra credit opportunity. So uh, after the labs are due, you can do a peer review of the lab. So you find a partner, uh, you each grade each other's labs according to this rubric, and you mark each other's reports, then you revise your own lab based on those marks. Uh, and if you do that thoroughly, we'll give you up to 10% of the formal reports for extra credit. So total, that would be 3% of your grade. Um, cool. So I think we're about out of time. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you on Friday.